Um, so an undeformed sedimentary basin has significant potential to host a DGR, and the Bruce Power site is in, in one of those basins. Um, but again, the, the key point for, is the, the suitability of any site needs to be demonstrated through research and considered on its, on its own merit. So that's the, the collective response. And with that, I think I can turn the presentation now over to Dr. Dr. John Adams. Thank you. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, panel members, and other participants. My name is John Adams. I'm a seismologist, and I've been working for Natural Resources Canada for about 32 years now. This Dr. Adams, can you move your microphone a little bit closer? Closer or further? Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Um, uh, what I'm presenting is a re response to a request from the panel for an introduction to earthquakes and seismic hazard in Canada, and then an evaluation of the proponent seismic hazard assessment. Um, this is the presentation outline. I'll talk a little bit about NRCAN's role in relation to earthquakes, just what is an earthquake, where are earthquakes most likely to occur and why, the seismograph network in Canada and what it does, earthquakes in eastern Canada, and then we'll move on to NRCAN's review of the seismic hazard assessment for the DGR. Thank you. Natural Resources Canada is the government of Canada's principal earth sciences agency. We are responsible for the provision of information on the actual or probable occurrence and intensity of earthquakes. We do this by recording and late locating earthquakes in Canada and adjacent seas, providing rapid information on significant earthquakes for emergency response, maintaining the Ca Canadian National Earthquake Catalogue, providing national seismic hazard assessments for the building code, and providing public information on earthquakes and seismic hazards. An earthquake is a sudden movement on a fault plane causing seismic vibrations. The key idea here is the larger the area on which there is movement or rupture, the larger the magnitude of the earthquake. This figure gives in a, in a, a cartoon form the relative fault areas for, for earthquakes of different magnitude. If you look in the top left corner, there's a little square which is representative of the earthquake in Haiti in 2010 of magnitude 7. By comparison, on the right-hand side is an area which corresponds to the magnitude 9.1 earthquake in Japan in 2011. It's about a thousand times bigger, and I think this graphic makes the point that the magnitude scale is a logarithmic scale, and one has to appreciate just how big the very biggest earthquakes are. For local comparison, in the bottom left is a small dot within a circle which shows the relative size of the Tomiskamen earthquake of 1935, which was magnitude 6.2. That's the largest close earthquake to the DGR site, and it was 350 kilometers away in the upper Ottawa Valley. Um, magnitude, as magnitude increases, the strength of ground shaking, the duration, and the area impacted increase very rapidly. The ground shaking increases by a factor of 10 for every magnitude unit. And you can see that on the graphic on the, on the right-hand side, where we go from magnitude 4 to 5 to 6. However, the energy increases even faster. It increases by 32 times for every magnitude unit. And in addition, the duration of shaking, which is important for damage, increases from a few seconds of shaking for a magnitude 4 to several minutes at magnitude 9. So we've seen that the earthquake magnitude depends on the size of the reactivated fault surface. And large earthquakes at plate boundaries can exceed magnitude 9, like the one in Japan. At the other end of the scale, earthquakes smaller than magnitude 2.5 are, are usually not felt, whereas for magnitude 4.5 earthquakes, the ground vibrations can be felt over large areas, three or 400 kilometers. However, even near the epicenter where the shaking is strongest, magnitude 5 is about the minimum magnitude to make light objects fall, and a 5.5 can cause some damage to masonry buildings. Now, in eastern Canada, the largest events we've had were a magnitude 7, or about approximately magnitude 7, in 1663 in Charlevoix, which is just downstream of Quebec City, and a magnitude 7.2 earthquake in 1929 south of Newfoundland on the offshore Grand Banks. Although we've had a few large earthquakes like this, almost all earthquakes are weaker than magnitude 5, below the thresholds that might cause damage to engineered facilities. 
if we look on a global scale where earthquakes are most likely to, to occur, we find they occur at the boundaries of the plates. The colored blocks of the, earth, of the Earth's surface here, almost like a jigsaw puzzle, show the various plates of the Earth. And in particular, the purpley one in the center, which has a, a green circle representing the DGR, that circle will turn up on all my maps, is the North American plate. The DGR is very close to the middle of that plate. However, the plates moving against each other cause earthquakes, and something like 98% of the world's earthquakes occur on the boundaries between the plates. That's to say, the, uh, along the color differences. And Japan is one of those boundaries. The area offshore of Vancouver is another one. But I would just emphasize that the DGR is in the middle of the North American plate. This map shows a 20-year snapshot of seismicity, which is concentrated at plate boundaries. The red circles are the magnitude six, and a, uh, magnitude 6 earthquakes, which are kind of moderate, and the yellow ones are the larger earthquakes. And as you can see, most of these are happening at the plate boundaries. So how do we know how these earthquakes happen? NRCAN runs a seismograph network across Canada. It's fairly sparse in the Arctic, but it's denser in southeastern Canada. In particular, if we zoom in on the area of, uh, of uh, southern Ontario, each of those symbols there rec represents a seismograph that is capable of recording quite tiny earthquakes. In particular on that figure are a number of green uh, diamonds, which are a network run by a Western University and financially supported by OPG and Bruce Power. Our own stations are in other colors. It's key to recognize that all of the data is shared, so that means that everyone has access to the, the vibration recordings of earthquakes. Since it was mentioned yesterday, I'll draw attention to the four stations closest to the DGR. Um, there is one, the, the one which is very closest in, is in Tiverton, uh, another one is in Walkerton, one is in Asheville, and one is in Maryville Lake. The three stations which were referred to as the borehole ones are the ones, not the Tiverton one, which is called BRCO, but the other three. And the goal of putting those stations in in August 2007 was to determine if there were any really tiny earthquakes quite close to the DGR. We believe that those stations would tell us about earthquakes of magnitude 1 or larger. Magnitude 1 is a very tiny earthquake, uh, should they occur. So let's move on to the Canadian National Earthquake Catalog. It's an authoritative inventory of earthquake information, and the key information we need was where was the earthquake location, how big was it, and if we can, the depth of the earthquake. It's based on historical and instrumental records, and imp importantly, we also include earthquakes in the United States. So we, we basically tap on uh, our own catalog and those in the United States so that we don't have a discontinuity across the border. As I showed you, NRCAN seismograph network can uh, detect all earthquakes greater than about magnitude 3 anywhere in Canada, and in the area around the Bruce, we're down to magnitude 1. As a consequence of the network, we currently locate about 5,000 earthquakes a year, almost all of which are too small or too remote to be felt. And just as a matter of interest, something like three quarters of those are actually from the Rocky Mountains to the west and a quarter is in the, upper, in, the, uh, in the Arctic or in eastern Canada. This map shows some of the larger earthquakes that we've accumulated uh, from our earthquake history. You'll see the, uh, on the bottom right there's the 1663 magnitude 7 earthquake close to Quebec City, the 1929 Grand Banks earthquake off the shore, and the 1935 earthquake just quite close to the DGR. If we look over to the west coast, the large rectangle with the date of 1700 is an earthquake that happened just before written history in, in, East, in North America that was probably of magnitude 9 and comparable in size to the, the earthquake in Japan, Tohoku earthquake in 2011. So that one just happened slightly prehistory. The 1949 earthquake was a magnitude 8 earthquake. and our most recent large earthquake happened just less, less than a year ago in Haida Gwaii, which was a magnitude 7.7. .7. In eastern Canada, the most recent largely f widely felt earthquake was the magnitude 5 Val de Bois earthquake, just north of Ottawa. 
It gave quite strong shaking in Ottawa, and it also led to T-shirts being sold in Toronto about I survived the great Toronto earthquake. <laughs> it was felt about out to Sault Ste. Marie, so these earthquakes are felt over quite a large area. I would point out that even close to the, the epicenter of that earthquake, there was almost no damage. So in, in summary for earthquakes in Eastern Canada, it's uncommon to feel an earthquake in Eastern Canada. The earthquakes do occur ma mainly in defined zones characterized by many tens of small earthquakes annually, and most of the earthquakes causing damage occur in these seismically active zones. Most earthquakes occur at depths between 5 and 25 kilometers deep in the earth, and they represent the reactivation of old faults. Only one historic earthquake is known to have caused a surface rupture. That was in Angava, northern Quebec, in 1989. Now, the flip side of this is that faults mapped at the surface, in other words, what a geologist would map, are not necessarily seismically active. And so then the Canadian National Earthquake Catalog and our knowledge of it form the basis of seismic hazard assessments. I've talked to the earthquakes uh, lying in clusters. So the first cluster okay, uh, is it this region of Western Quebec, which is the closest area of high activity relative to the DGR. There's a region near Quebec City, which had that magnitude 7 earthquake, another in the Lower St. Lawrence, and also earthquakes in the Appalachians. To conclude this section on earthquakes in eastern Canada, Magnitude 8 plus earthquakes are expected near plate boundaries, but Eastern Canada is an intraplate environment. Eastern Canada does experience a relatively low rate of earthquakes, but some well defined zones are more active, such as the one in West Quebec. And historically, most earthquakes in Eastern Canada have occurred in these well defined zones and have caused only minor damage. The region around Lake Huron has lower seismicity than most of Eastern Canada. The historical observations and seismic recordings are used to develop seismic hazard maps for the National Building Code of Canada. And the 2010 map is shown in the lower uh, right. Uh, the colors are, are coming out. We've got the kind of strong oranges along the Ottawa Valley, the pale yellows around Toronto, and the DGR is one of the lower hazard areas that we map. Thank you. I'd like to move on to the uh, uh, review and assessment of seismic hazard. I'm going to talk a little more about how seismic hazard is assessed, the, the, scope, and approach, the scope and approach of NRCAN's review, um, the, and a summary of it and our conclusions. I would like to just summarize by saying that we think that the EIS is a satisfactory basis for the safe design of the proposed repository, and we have two recommendations. I've said that the seismic rate is low in the vicinity of the uh, planned repository. And the map on the right-hand side shows our knowledge of earthquakes that are close to the Bruce G DGR. It ha includes earthquakes as small as magnitude 1. And I think the largest one on there was near Ohio of magnitude 5. In this region, great earthquakes like the one in Japan are impossible. And although the rate of small nearby earthquakes is low, rare large earthquakes pose a hazard to the repository, particularly because of its long life. The best way to assess and quantify the hazard is through a probabilistic seismic hazard assessment, a PSHA. A PSHA usually addresses the question, if tomorrow and the next year and the next century were like recorded history, how strong would the shaking be at the usually low specified probabilities? Design for such low probability shaking is required to provide high reliability engineered structures. A probabilistic seismic hazard assessment uses the rate of small earthquakes from a catalog, assumptions about their size distribution, in other words, we know that we have many more small earthquakes than large ones, assumptions or observations of their spatial distribution and a knowledge of the origins and causes of earthquakes. We need this together with the shaking effects of earthquakes of different size and distance. And we use ground motion prediction equations or GMPs to do that. And then we can estimate the strength of shaking for the next year, the next century, the next millennium. 
I'd point out that the required knowledge is much more than the size of the biggest earthquake. It's the combination of large magnitude and proximity that matters. As an aside, I will say that southern Ontario has experienced two magnitude 9 earthquakes in the past decade. Of course, they were far, far away in Sumatra and Japan. So it's not just the size of the earthquake that matters. They have to be close to you before the shaking becomes important. Strong shaking can come from very close, moderate earthquakes or from more distant, large earthquakes. The low probabilities we derive from the short historical record mostly reflect the low probability of the earthquake being close to the site, rather than the low probability of the earthquake occurring in south, southern Ontario. And that is taking southern Ontario as being a much larger area than the area that we're interested in close to the site. Here, NRCAN assessed the AMIC report, which is the DGRTR 2011-20, in light of our experience with PSHA for the National Building Code of Canada. We reviewed it from the point of view of contemporary earthquake shaking hazard, longer term seismic hazard, earthquake generated tsunami hazard, faulting hazard, and we also comment on beyond design issues. NRCAN accepts that different practitioners may choose different input parameters and weight them in different ways, leading to different estimates. Where estimates differ, it's important to consider the uncertainty in each, as the difference may not be significant given the uncertainty. Firstly, talking about the contemporary earthquake shaking hazard, the AMIC report used in OPG's EIS is a state-of-the-art, site-specific PSHA, and it is comprehensive. AMIC's earthquake source models are similar to NRCAN's National Building Code model sources, but are differently weighted, and they include extra fault sources. The map on the right just shows some of the fault sources that were considered. There are a number of these near Lake Ontario which are not directly relevant to low probability hazard for the DGR. The one source that extends past the DGR and extends effectively from Windsor up towards North Bay and then into Quebec uh, is the Grenville Front Tectonic Zone. It was considered a p possible uh, earthquake source by AMEC, but they gave that source only a 1% probability that it would be generating large damaging earthquakes. And finally, the ground motion prediction equations, which are an important part of the uh, hazard assessment used by AMEC, were similar to the ones that NRCAM will use for the 2015 National Building Code of Canada. In our assessment, there were two places where the AMEC report may not be conservative. That is, the estimated values may possibly be too low. Firstly, the maximum magnitude earthquakes to be expected. The ones in the AMIC report are smaller than the values NRCAN or USGS would use. And secondly, how the earthquake rates are smoothed in space. NRCAN prefers uniform smoothing, not kernel smoothing, particularly for assessing the hazard for such long life facilities. I'll explain a little bit about what kernel smoothing is. Kernel smoothing gives high hazard near recent clusters of earthquakes and low elsewhere. Uniform smoothing says that effectively the entire region near Lake Huron has essentially the same hazard. The difficulty in using kernel smoothing is that you might have a 100 year record where you have a few earthquakes in one place and all of a sudden you have high hazard near those earthquakes and if you have no earthquakes near another site then the hazard is low. So for a long life facility we believe that uniform smoothing is the appropriate way to go. We, we put into our submission that there was one place where we believed that the AMIC report may be conservative. That may be that they estimated the values to be too high. However, the proponent told me that their experts, uh, in fact, didn't, uh, did take this into account, and so I withdraw this slide. There is no extra conservatism. In summary, AMIC performed a thorough assessment of uncertainty and provided the mean hazard and also the uncertainty on the mean hazard. NRCAN is completing a new national seismic hazard map for the National Building Code of 2015. That model is less complex than AMEC's regional model. 
Nevertheless, the national model give hazard results for the repository sites similar to Amex, and the agreement is well within the uncertainty bounds for each estimate. On, that, on the basis of that agreement, NRCAN determines the EIS to be a satisfactory basis for the safe des design of the repository against contemporary earthquake shaking. But we recommend that extra conservatism on the mean shaking level should be considered during detailed design because of the low maximum magnitudes adopted and the kernel smoothing approach in OPG's PSHA. I move on now to the longer term seismic hazard. Um, if you remember, I talked about contemporary seismic hazard in that we were estimating at low probabilities what might happen over the next, say, 100 years. However, both NRCAN and OPG seismic hazard assessment, sorry, present a snapshot estimate of the seismic hazard assuming that the present day is representative. The repository will have a very long design life. It is expected that the stress regime will change with the next glaciation. Norway, Sweden, and Finland have a comparable glacial history to southern Ontario, but their record of prehistoric earthquakes is better studied. Current interpretation of their records suggests that earthquake activity is suppressed during a glaciation and released in a pulse during deglaciation. And for us, the last deglaciation was about 12,000 years ago. NRCAN concludes that a higher chance of strong earthquake shaking should be expected during the next deglaciation than indicated by the contemporary seismic hazard assessment. And just to put that into perspective, that's an event that would happen somewhere uh, at least 60,000 and maybe 80,000 years in the future. The consequences, if any of this, should be assessed as part of the beyond design considerations. And we'll come to that at the end. NRCAN look briefly at earthquake generated tsunami hazard. The generation of large tsunamis greater than two meters would require a very large earthquake of magnitude about six and a half to displace the lake bottom. Based on the PSHA conducted for the DGR site, the rate of such earthquakes occurring are extremely low. The rates for earthquake generated tsunamis would be even lower at the site. A number of things have to happen. You have to have an earthquake. It has to be under the lake. It has to cause, be shallow enough to cause deformation of the lake bottom. NRCAN is satisfied that the earthquake generated tsunami hazard is negligible. NRCAN notes that the project design includes seven meters of freeboard, freeboard being the height above the 500 year Lake Huron water level. Uh, and NRCAN considers this a useful mitigating factor for beyond design tsunami flooding. Faulting hazard. Faulting through or near the repository would provide an easy path for rapid release of radioactive elements. NRCAN agrees with the proponent that the lack of faulting near the repository site and the low pour water pressure in the repository rock are a good indication there have been no nearby large surface rupturing earthquakes. The rate of large earthquakes estimated by the contemporary seismic hazard assessment is very low and the chance of one occurring within one kilometer of the repository appears to be an order of magnitude less than one in a million. The strongest argument that future faulting is unlikely to affect the integrity of the vault during its intended lifespan is that it has not happened in the last hundred plus million years. As a conclusion to this section, I would like to say the contemporary seismic hazard has been quantified appropriately. The EIS provides a satisfactory basis for a safe des design of the repository against contemporary earthquake shaking. The longer term seismic hazard will include periods when the probability of strong shaking is higher than the contemporary hazard. The hazard of an earthquake generated tsunami is negligible and the faulting hazard is, is extremely low. I want to conclude with a discussion of beyond design considerations. As a result of the effects of the 2011 Tohoku earthquake on the Fukushima nuclear power plant, there has been continued emphasis in nuclear safety on beyond design events. That is, considering what if scenarios beyond the design level. The design level, such as that based on the seismic hazard results, should provide an adequate level of safety. That's what the safety case is about. 
However, events larger than the design are possible, though their probability is extremely low. Current nuclear safety philosophy is that design should be robust in the sense that failure mode should be considered and mitigation suggested so that a small or moderate exceedance of the design level does not lead to catastrophic failure. For the DGR, this would be a large release of radioactivity into the environment. In some cases, the cost of providing mitigation may be trivial, and good practice suggests it should be incorporated into the design. For example, had the backup power systems at Fukushima been raised on plinths above the 2011 tsunami flooding level, there would have been no loss of on-site power and the nuclear disaster might not have happened. In other cases, the cost may be assessed as disproportionate to the benefit and the mitigation may not be implemented. I'd like to point out that the cost is more than the dollar cost. It may include construction decay, uh, delays, fundamental project design, and more importantly, the chance that making this change may degrade other safety systems making low, for lower overall performance. And I'd like to give you an example from a workshop I was at where they have, for the Pickering plant, they have put flood doors in, which would stop floodwaters getting into critical parts of the plant. And my naive question was, well, you could have made it twice as high. The answer was it would have impeded fire access. So one has to balance off these sorts of changes with, to make sure that you have a, 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 an overall reduction of safety. With this in mind, NRCAN recommends, recommendation two, detailed design should consider mitigation strategies or contingency plans for conditions arising from beyond design ground motions. Thank you. <laughs>